I will uh, start. So first I want to thank um, the Centre de Recherche Institut de Geriatrie de Montreal, sorry for my accent, for inviting me to give a talk. I'm happy to meet everyone on Zoom and I look forward to answering questions at the end. Okay, can I keep going? Yeah, all right. Today I'll be talking to you about results from two large scale studies. Um, the Montreal Adult Lifespan Study conducted wait, wait. in my lab. Sorry? Is someone talking? Should I wait? Hello? Okay. Well, I, I think okay. you can go, it's okay. Uh, sorry, okay. That was, so a, that was we, an issue. We okay. already started, okay? Something okay. is with the internet like, apparently here. Should I continue or should I wait? I suggest you can you can go. Okay. So today I'll be talking to you about results from two larger scale studies. Um, the first I refer to as the Montreal Adult Lifespan Study conducted in my lab between 2013 and 2018. And the second is the Prevent AD Study conducted at the Stop AD Center since 2011. In both these studies, a task fMRI was used to assess episodic memory, encoding, and success. Right. So, so in the next few minutes, I'll be talking to you first, I'll give you a brief background of cognitive aging and why I study episodic memory function in adulthood. I will then describe the Montreal Adult Lifespan Study in detail and briefly present results from our initial planned analyses just to give a framework for the sex differences analyses that we then did. And then I'll present to you um, the sex differences analysis that we did for this project and a follow-up analysis where we did a parallel analysis in the Prevent AD cohort. And I'll then give general conclusions based on what we've observed across these two studies. But before I go on, I want to first acknowledge my trainees over here, oh, there we go, who really did most of the work that I'm gonna be presenting to you today and my um, support, my financial support, my funding agencies and the collaborators that have helped these projects um, go on. Okay, so let's begin. <laughs> I always like to start my talks off with this figure from a review article by Denise Park and Patricia Ruta Lawrence that nicely summarizes what we know about the effect of age on cognition. So what you could see here are Z scores for different types of cognitive tasks and age along the X axis. And you can see that with advanced age, you see declines in performance in a variety of cognitive tasks, such as speed of processing, working memory, and long-term memory. However, it's not all bad news. Um, there are also some um, cognitive processes that remain or maintain their function across the lifespan, such as world knowledge. Now, in my lab, we've been focusing on understanding the neural basis of age-related long-term memory decline, specifically episodic memory. So what is episodic memory? Um, Tobin defined it in the early 70s as our ability to encode, store, and retrieve past events, such as recognition for past events, in rich spatial and temporal contextual detail. So an episodic memory is believed to consist of both the content of one's memory, which refers to the past event or item or object that was the focus of our attention, and the associated intra-item associations plus the surrounding spatial and temporal contextual details, the how, when, and where of the past event, which highlights memory for inter-item and item context associations. Past work indicates that memory for these contextual detail, which I will refer to as associative source or context memory, relies on having intact mnemonic and cognitive control processes. So for example, here you see um, a picture of someone giving a talk and in a non-COVID world, it might be me giving a talk to you in real life, which would have been nice. Um, and tomorrow, if someone were to ask you, where were you sitting in the audience when Natasha gave her talk? Um, you could give a response based in two ways. So first, you could have a detailed recollection of the spatial detail, uh, spatial context in which you were sitting when you saw me talk. And you could then say, oh, I was sitting in the back left corner of the room while I watched her give a talk. And that would rely on more detailed mnemonic 
processes which are thought to be mediated by the medial temporal lobe. In addition, you could also deduce where you were talking. So you might remember that, oh, you know, she was very much in the corner on the right of my field of view. Um, so I must have been sitting on the left side on the back of the room. And so in that case, you've used some cognitive control processes and strategies to deduce um, the mnemonic content. And so that relies more on the prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex. So from this literature in young adults, we could then assume that age-related declines in episodic memory probably reflect differences in mnemonic processes and cognitive control functions and their associated brain regions. However, it is important to note that aging doesn't affect all aspects of episodic memory equally. So here I present to you some data from a study we conducted um, back in 2010, actually between 2010 and 2007, where we had young and older adults perform different types of memory tasks for faces. So individuals were presented with faces to the left or the right um, of a computer screen and then were asked to either retrieve the face, so just an item recognition for the face, um, retrieve the spatial context, so whether a face was on the left or the right, or the relative temporal order of two faces. And so what you see here is the average reaction time data, the average reaction time data, and the average accuracy from that study. And you'll notice that there really aren't age-related differences in accuracy and very subtle age-related differences in reaction time recognition, but the age-related differences become greater for spatial and then even greater for temporal context memory. So this and many other studies have shown that memory for spatial, for associative source or context memory is uh, greatly impacted by age to a greater degree than recognition or item memory. So why might this be? Um, Nave Benjamin et al. have uh, contributed the associate deficit hypothesis to try and explain why older adults may show greater difficulties in associative memory compared to item memory. So they, pr they propose that um, older adults may show these associative memory deficits because they have difficulties in binding information, so the item and the context, the inter-item associative binding at encoding and or at retrieval. Um, this may also be pr more pronounced for intentional versus incidental encoding. And they've also shown in their research that associative memory is more sensitive um, to extraneous factors that in general affect memory, such as sensory decline, stimulus complexity, and time of day effects. So not only is there variance in the type of episodic memory tasks that older adults uh, show greater or lesser degrees of decline in, but there's also a great degree of individual differences in cognitive aging, even when there's little sample diversity. So here's um, some longitudinal data where individuals are tested at two times, and it's an averaged uh, data across various different types of cognitive operations, including episodic memory. And what you know is that there's significant amount of inter-individual variability in cognitive, in, uh, cognitive aging, including episodic memory. So the trajectory of cognitive aging is not the same for everyone, and an individual's performance on measures of ability may change across uh, time and may depend on different life circumstances, such as health status, lifestyle, education, socioeconomic status, etc. So the trajectory varies from different cognitive functions and the tasks also vary um, within individuals. And so there's quite a lot of diversity in how older adults perform episodic memory tasks and how they exhibit cognitive decline. Some older adults may maintain episodic memory and perform as well as young adults, while others may show some decline. And in others yet, there might be um, such an extent of episodic memory decline that it might be indicative of Alzheimer's disease. So indeed, as I mentioned, Alzheimer's disease is, um, one of the earliest signs of Alzheimer's disease is episodic memory decline. So here's some data from a study done in 2000 by Bachman et al, where they compared retrospectively free recall and recognition memory scores in individuals that later either converted to Alzheimer's disease or not. So here you see bar graphs of tests on free, free recall at time one and time two, and then recognition memory at time one and time uh, two. And what you notice is that there is um, a decline earlier on in pre-recall and recognition memory in individuals that later converted to Alzheimer's disease 
compared to individuals that maintained uh, cognitive function and remained quote unquote normal healthy agers. And so this indicated that indeed episodic memory decline may be one of the earliest signs of Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, there are no effective treatments for Alzheimer's disease currently, and there's a growing consensus that prevention and delay may be the best way to reduce future burden of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias in our society. Moreover, there's growing consensus in the aging and dementia, uh, dementia um, literature that the neuropathology associated with Alzheimer's disease may be present decades prior to symptom onset at midlife. So given that episodic memory decline is one of the earliest signs of Alzheimer's disease, we thought it was important to explore the neural correlates of episodic memory across the adult lifespan and compare and contrast memory-related brain activations to see when memory decline is observed in healthy adults without Alzheimer's disease risk factors in order to identify brain networks associated with episodic memory decline in these healthy, hopefully potentially healthy aging individuals. We focused on midlife in um, this study that I'm going to talk to you about because we suspected that it's a critical period in adult development when the day-to-day -day stress related to achieving work-life balance converges with the initial signs of neurocognitive aging and perhaps the effect of early signs of Alzheimer's disease on the brain. In women, these challenges are further exacerbated by the hormonal changes associated with menopause. So we really um, started this study, the Adult Lifespan Study in Montreal, with the idea that midlife may be a critical period in adulthood where we might start to see episodic memory decline and start to see uh, differences in brain function in uh, adulthood, in healthy adults without risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. So now I'm going to describe to you a bit about uh, the Montreal Adult Lifespan Study that was conducted in my lab between 2013 and 2018. So this is a, a cross-sectional task of MRI study of episodic memory across the adult lifespan. It was aimed to determine if associative memory, context memory deficits emerged first at midlife, and also to identify the neural correlates of age-related memory decline at that time point, specifically midlife and onward. In addition, in this study, which I'm not gonna to talk to you about today because of time constraints, um, we also investigated if having a family history of Alzheimer's disease and genetic risk for Alzheimer's, such as an ApoE4 allele, altered memory and brain function in midlife. That analysis has been published, so you can look it up, but due to um, the focus of today's talk being on sex differences, what I'll do now is present to you uh, the background of this study and our preliminary aging results, and then the results from our sex differences analysis. So this study consisted of two visits. Um, we recruited young, middle-aged, and older adults from the Montreal population. Um, they came in for one visit where they did a bunch of neuropsychological assessments, filled out questionnaires, and did a medical assessment. Um, our inclusion and exclusion criteria for the study was all individuals had to be right-handed, self-reported as bilingual or multilingual, and they were tested in either French or English, depending on their preference. They had no history of neurological insult, psychological illness, or substance abuse, and they had no family history of Alzheimer's disease. So this is something important I want to highlight. So these individuals did fill out a Cache County questionnaire to assess Alzheimer's disease in the family, and they um, did not have an Alzheimer's disease uh, family history. So they were minus FH, is the term I'll be using. Um, they had no history of diabetes, stroke, or heart attack, nor were they suffering from high blood pressure. So this was an extremely elite group of individuals um, that you know, were optimal agers in many ways. Um, on this visit, they gave blood uh, for, base, uh, for ApoE genotyping. So we did have that data, but the group that I'm gonna to present to you now are minus FH and only a small portion, I think four people had an E4 allele in this large group across the entire lifespan. So on the second visit, they came in for fMRI testing at the Douglas Brain Imaging Center in a 3T Siemens magnetom trio. So this was before our Prisma Fit upgrade. We obtained a structural T1 MP RAGE scan and then a series of functional bowl scans uh, while individuals performed both encoding and retrieval phases 
for two types of associative context memory tasks, a spatial context memory task and a temporal context memory task. Now, importantly, we had two levels of difficulty in this study. So we had an easy version of spatial and temporal context memory tasks and a difficult version. So there's four tasks in total, and we'll be using the short forms SE, SH, TE, and TH to indicate spatial easy, spatial hard, temporal easy, and temporal hard. So here you see the experimental design of the study. Um, so individuals came in, they had 12 behavioral runs. Each run included an encoding and retrieval phases for easy tasks and a difficult task. And so here you have the encoding of a difficult task. We had 12 faces presented, one face at a time to the left or the right. And participants were asked to encode the face and also make a pleasantness decision. So was the face pleasant or neutral? And this was basically done to engage the individual and to have them make a response during encoding to make sure they didn't fall asleep. And so they were asked to encode these faces and they were told either to encode the spatial location of the face or to focus on the temporal order of the faces presented. So they knew ahead of time what the task demands were. And so after encoding, they had a one minute distraction task where they had two words which they had to alphabetically organize. And then after the distraction, they had a retrieval. So in this study, there was, was a two alternative forced choice retrieval task where they saw two old faces and they were asked to present, uh, to decide um, which of the two old faces was either presented to the left or the right, the spatial context memory task, or which of these two old, um, previously seen faces were earlier in the list or later on the list, so most recent or least recent. So the entire experiment was very long. It took two hours in the scanner, um, and in the entire experiment, there were 72 encoding and 30, 36 retrieval events for each trial type. So for spatial easy, e, uh, spatial easy, spatial hard, temporal easy, and temporal hard. Okay, so here I'm going to present to you behavioral analysis of a subset of this cohort uh, with a sample size of 131. So again, these are individuals without a family history of Alzheimer's disease. And you see the accuracy um, score on the y-axis and the different task types, spatial easy, spatial hard, temporal easy, and temporal hard. Young adults are in blue, middle age in orange, and the older adults in gray. And when we did a repeated measures in NOVA, we found a significant effect of age group. We also found a significant effect of task difficulty, um, task by difficulty interaction, sorry. So the difficulty uh, um, effect was more significant in the temporal task compared to the spatial task. The post hoc analysis of the independent variable of age group confirmed that middle age was indeed the time when these episodic memory deficits were arising. So young adults perform significantly better than middle and older aged adults. This is exceptionally true for the spatial hard, the temporal easy, and the temporal hard. The, reckon, the spatial easy task, they were relatively comparable and the effect was more linear where the middle age group was not that different between young or between old. So what you'd expect. So when we included the sex and gender in this analysis, we did not see any significant effect for sex. Um, nor did we see any sex by age interactions, so in our full sample. So this study was set out, as I said, to look at age-related differences in the neural correlates of episodic memory, in addition to look at risk factors in midlife. So I'm going to present to you some of the planned analyses because it frames how we interpret the sex differences analyses that we did. So I'm going to present to you some work um, done by my previous PhD student, Elizabeth Ankudovich, um, where we looked at age and performance effects in brain activation at encoding and retrieval in a subset of the cohort. So out of the 131 adults that we had good behavioral data for, um, 128 also had good MRI data. And so here you see the sample characteristics um, for the individuals included in this analysis. So we had 45 young adults, 39 middle-aged adults, and 44 um, older adults. So what we did was we took um, the brain activation data from these individuals for events where they successfully, successfully encoded and retrieved um, either the spatial or the temporal context information for faces. And then we cross-correlated these brain activation patterns with two vectors of, um, of age and accuracy. So to do this, we used a method called uh, brain 
behavior partially squares analysis. So this is a multivariate technique, which I'm not going to talk to you about because of time. Um, and sometimes it confuses people more. But just what I said, um, we had a group matrix of all the brain imaging data for correctly encoded and correctly retrieved events for the four tasks of interest. We cross-correlated that with age and accuracy. And then we had this um, matrix of the cross-correlation matrix, which we then submitted to singular value decomposition, which is what PLS does. And this is an iterative process, which basically identifies a patterns of brain activation that maximally correlate with your vectors of interest, which in this case were age and accuracy. So it yields three important um, variables. First, a singular value, which tells you the proportion of covariance accounted for by a certain effect, and a paired latent variable. So what I'm going to just call results. Uh, so paired latent variable identifies both a singular image, which represents both positive and negative effects repre represented in its paired correlation profile. So the correlation profile will show um, how brain, activity, how brain activity correlates with age and correlates with accuracy. So I think when I show you the results, it'll be a bit more uh, clear what I'm talking about here. So with PLS, uh, we assess significance through both permutation tests um, for the pattern of uh, brain behavior correlations that we see. And also we assess the stability of the activations that we, that we see associated with that pattern using bootstrap estimation. So when we did this with our full sample of 128 um, adult lifespan data, uh, including age and performance, we identified quite a few latent variables or results. Um, so here's our first result. And um, this latent variable identified basically an age performance trade-off. So here you see the singular image. You see red areas and blue areas. So the red areas we call positive saliences, the blue areas are negative saliences. And here you see the brain behavior correlation plot that I talked about. So you see that age is in the positive direction and performance is in the negative direction. So this means that areas in red, the positive salience region, increased activation as a function of age. So they're positively correlated with this. And they decreased activation as a function of performance. Conversely, areas in blue increased activation as a function of age and decreased activation as a function, um, sorry, increased activation as a function of performance and decreased activation as a function of age. So these are reciprocal <laughs> pairings between the brain activation and brain behavior correlation plots. So what I want you to note is that in general, you see activation in the midline, it's traditionally called a recollection memory network during um, successful encoding and successful retrieval across the lifespan. And these areas decrease as a function of age generally. And with age, you see increased activation in these lateral temporal and superior temporal areas in addition to supermarginal gyrus. So this is a more general age by performance trade-off effect. So we also saw two other um, latent variables that identified phase-related differences in correlation. So these are, er so by this I mean areas where older adults activated the region to a larger degree in one phase, such as encoding, but in which performance was actually correlated with activation in those same regions in the different phase, such as retrieval. So here you see a pattern of activation that encapsulates left frontal parietal uh, cortex, right frontal parietal cortex, the ventral visual stream, and the medial temporal lobes, um, where activation in these regions increased with age at encoding. But activation in these same regions at retrieval supported memory. So even though older adults increased activation in these areas at encoding, it didn't support subsequent memory for these areas because the bars for accuracy are crossing zero here at encoding. Now, we, the other pattern identified areas of activation in which older adults increased activation, so the red areas, at retrieval. And increasing activation as a function of age at retrieval was associated with poorer performance. In contrast, increasing activation in these areas during spatial encoding supported performance. Okay, we also did a univariate analysis of this data set and extracted uh, mean activations in uh, visual, visual areas, periphacampal areas, parietal regions, and prefrontal regions. 
and we looked at whether or not there were linear or nonlinear effects in, um, in activation as a function of age uh, in these regions. And what we found was in middle and older adults, we saw very little modulation of the ventral visual areas uh, during encoding versus retrieval. But in young adults, we saw an increase in ventral visual processing at retrieval compared to, um, to encoding. In parietal regions, we saw that young and middle-aged adults showed modulation between encoding and retrieval, but older adults did not, and they seemed to engage parietal cortex to the same degree at encoding and retrieval. In the anterior prefrontal areas, we saw that all, old, all adults engaged these regions at encoding, but there was an increase as a function of age, similar to what we saw in the brain behavior PLS um, at encoding, and we saw an inverse pattern at retrieval. What's important to note though is when you compare the activations between the two phases, it is only the young adults that show an increase between phase and the older adults that show a decrease from encoding to retrieval. So the conclusions from this first like just general um, age-related analysis of our adult lifespan study was that A, midlife was indeed a critical period when episodic memory decline as measured by these context memory uh, tasks first arised. Um, and we also saw between group activation and nonlinear age effect effects in our uh, multiple behavior PLS analyses. So we saw that there was an age performance trade-off effect which was primarily observed in ventral visual and inferior parietal cortex. And we saw that this ventral visual area, ventral visual stream showed a de-differentiation or lack of flexibility between encoding and retrieval that appeared at midlife and that the parietal uh, cortex started to show the same pattern in late life. So these areas that show these age performance trade-off also showed age-related differences in their pattern of de-differentiation. We also observed age-related increases in left more than right frontal parietal activity at encoding in the brain behavior PLS, but the univariate analysis indicates that there was little phase-related modulation um, in middle-aged adults. In young and older adults, we did see a phase-related modulation. But importantly, the phase-related increase of um, left and right frontal parietal cortex at encoding in older adults did not relate to better memory performance. So it did not increase subsequent memory. So in this whole um, grouped analysis where both women and men were combined, we do not see any evidence of compensation in the aging brain. So after we did this analysis, we decided to look at whether or not there were sex differences in the effects we already observed. Now, why did we decide to explore sex differences in this analysis? So at the same time that we were conducting the study between 2013 and 2018, there was this insurgence of literature indicating that um, there were sex differences in the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and that women were more likely to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in late life compared to men. So in the US, the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease is higher in women compared to men. Um, so given that episodic memory decline is an early sign of Alzheimer's disease, and we know that um, there are age-related declines in episodic memory, we want to explore whether or not these age-related declines might be moderated by sex or, there, or whether there were sex differences in the effect of age. And the reason we did this was to try and understand, even independent of Alzheimer's disease and independent of um, genetic or familial history of Alzheimer's disease, whether there were differences in brain aging in women and men, because we need to know this foundational information in healthy aging before we could start to interpret results in adults that have risk factors for Alzheimer's disease in our hopes of trying to understand why women are in greater risk of developing Alzheimer's disease in late life. So when you think of why are women um, more, why is there a greater prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in men, uh, sorry, in women compared to men, you could have many potential explanations. So one can be that there are biological sex differences that put women at greater risk of developing Alzheimer's later in life. Um, but you could also argue that some of these um, factors that place women at greater risk of developing Alzheimer's disease are gender and gendered life experiences, such as social cultural determinants of health, and gender identity. 
So for example, we know that there are sex differences in education and experiences of violence and women in general have lower socioeconomic status. So perhaps these gendered life experiences contribute to why women are at greater risk for Alzheimer's disease. Now, another reason that women may be at greater risk for Alzheimer's disease may be due to issues relating to reproductive health, such as the number of pregnancies that a woman experiences and sex differences in the cumulative lifetime exposure to gonadal sex hormones. And moreover, there might be in interactions between sex and known Alzheimer's disease risk factors, such as the ApoE allele. So for instance, Molero et al. and Payami et al. in 1997 found an increased risk of familial Alzheimer's disease in women carriers of the E4 allele, but not in men carriers. So there is some growing evidence that having an ApoE4 risk factor might be a greater risk for women compared to men uh, to develop Alzheimer's disease. So here we are, we're gonna look at a healthy cohort with no risk factors for Alzheimer's disease or very little risk factors of known risk for Alzheimer's disease. So why are we interested in sex differences in this cohort? So even if the incidence of age-related cognitive decline and or Alzheimer's disease does not differ between sexes, so forget the slide I just told you, but even if that wasn't true, even if women were more, not, more likely to get Alzheimer's disease, I would argue that it's still important to look at sex differences. Why? Because the neural basis of cognitive de decline may not be the same between the sexes. So if the neural basis is not the same, then the treatment interventions or the um, therapeutic interventions may not be optimized for the two sexes. So perhaps to improve precision health and support early detection, prevention, delay, and even cure of Alzheimer's disease, and also to support healthy cognitive aging, we really should consider sex differences in the brain mechanisms of cognitive decline in women and men. So before I present the sex differences analysis of our lifespan data, I wanna just tell you a bit about um, the different types of sex differences that might exist. So in our lifespan data, which I already showed you the behavioral data for, we did not see any qualitative differences in male or female behavior, nor did we see any quantitative differences. Um, However, this does not mean that the underlying mechanisms do not differ. Moreover, it could be that there might be latent differences in the sexes. So it could be that age, environment, genotype, or even disease risk may moderate how women and men experience um, episodic memory decline with age. So in addition to those types of sex differences, you could also talk about sexual dimorphism, sexual differences, and sex convergence and divergence. So I want you to focus on this one because this is probably um, what is the reality in healthy aging. So this implies that even though the endpoints in males and females um, may be similar, the neural underpinnings may be different. So with this in mind, we conducted an exploratory analysis um, of our adult lifespan data to look at sex differences in the effective age on memory-related brain function. So this study uh, was led by my PhD student, uh, Savanya Subramaniapile, um, who really took the lead on this paper. So here's a sample. Um, here's the sample that we included in this analysis. It's a subsample of the larger adult lifespan study um, that we presented earlier. And the reason for this was because we were limited in the number of men. So we basically took the men that we had in our, in our um, adult lifespan sample and we matched women on age and on education. So you have the total number of males and females in young adults, middle-aged adults, and older adults. And you could see that um, there was obviously a difference in age across groups, but there was no difference in education, IQ, BDI, or performance on the CVLT. Um, there was a, a difference with BMI because with advanced age, you have an increase in BMI. We also saw a significant difference with age in smoking history because our older participants had a higher history of smoking. And just to show that the, behaviorally, these cohorts were the same as our larger lifespan study, you note that the same age effects are present for all of our tasks um, that we presented in the scanner. So we conducted the exact same analysis as we did for the adult lifespan, the full adult lifespan that I presented to you earlier. The only difference is that this time it was a between group analysis where the groups were the biological sex in which adults identified as doing scanning. 
So I'm now going to present to you the PLS results when we disaggregated the data by sex. So just to orient you again, PLS is parallel, so you have both positive and negative saliences and positive and negative correlations. Here you have the results for males and females. This is the pattern of age correlation, and this is the pattern of accuracy correlation. And this is the singular image. So here you see that we mostly um, identified negative salience brain regions in this first result that we identified. Um, this means that these areas increased in activity as a function of age in women during easy spatial tasks and hard spatial tasks. In men, we did not see any um, age-related modulation in this set of brain regions. Now, in relation to performance, you see that there was less difference. Both women and men um, showed greater performance or greater subsequent memory for spatial context memory if they engaged this set of brain regions at encoding. And in women, engaging these same set of brain regions at retrieval supported memory function as well. However, with advanced age, women tend to show reduced activation of these areas at retrieval. So increased activation at encoding, reduced activation at retrieval, but engaging these regions supported memory in both women and men. The second result we saw from this analysis um, identified areas where there were sex differences in the effective age. So areas in red, exhibited greater um, activation as a function of age in women during spatial easy tasks, and less um, activation as a function of age during retrieval in men. And these age-related differences in activation in both sexes were related to poor performance. So even though older women increased activation in these red regions, increasing activation was related to poor performance. Similarly for men, even though they decreased activation in these red regions, decreasing activation was poorer for performance at retrieval. Um, the inverse patterns are true for the blue or negative salience regions. And then the third result um, identified a pattern of brain activation that women engaged across all tasks at both encoding and retrieval. So this is a pattern of dedifferentiation in women, which were unrelated to task performance. So women activated all these red regions to a greater degree as a function of age, and increasing activation in these regions was related to poor retrieval performance, so it did not benefit performance in women. In contrast, men showed decreased activation in these regions at encoding, but it was only decreased activation at retrieval, which would have been beneficial for performance. So overall, again, here's a pattern of activation that was related to poorer performance in both women and men as a function of age. So, Overall, the results from this um, sex differences analysis of the adult lifespan data indicates that there is evidence for both sexual convergence and divergence in the aging brain. By that, I mean that women and men exhibited similar brain behavior associations at encoding, which was identified by our first pattern here and here, and by our third pattern. In addition, they showed some, to some extent, similar brain behavior correlations at retrieval. However, there was significant age-related differences in these associations. So another way of thinking of this is young women and men show very similar brain behavior activations at encoding and retrieval. But with advanced age, the sexes start to diverge as to what brain areas support memory function. So in men, age-related increases and decreases in brain activity that we identified, so patterns across the brain that we identified, um, did not relate to better performance. So even though there were fewer age-related fluctuations in men, those that we did observe in men did not support um, better memory performance with advanced age. However, in women, in our first latent variable, we identified a set of regions that increased as a function of age and encoding and did support memory function for the hardest task, which is the spatial hard task. So in women, we observed evidence of compensation in the aging brain at encoding. So age-related increases in left lateral prefrontal and parietal cortex at encoding in women predicted better subsequent memory effects. So what this um, 
analysis showed us was first that it's very important to disaggregate our data by sex because when we first looked at this data set, we identified a very similar pattern of activation of increased uh, frontal parietal activation at encoding, um, but it did not relate to better performance when we didn't disaggregate the data by sex. But when we did disaggregate the data by sex, we saw that effect was predominantly driven by women and that it did support successful encoding for the most challenging task in this analysis, which is the spatial heart task. So the take home messages from the adult lifespan study were that the neural correlates of age-related spatial context memory decline differed in men and women. And age-related compensatory activity was only observed in women in this cohort. So we wanted to follow up that analysis with another cohort, uh, a cohort that was at risk for Alzheimer's disease. So this was um, the prevent AD cohort. And this cohort is only consists of older adults. So older adults um, ranging from the age of 55 to in their 80s in this cohort. And uh, we wanted to basically look at A, can we replicate the effects that we saw um, from our lifespan data in this cohort with risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, or were there marked differences when you considered adults with risk factors for Alzheimer's disease? So are the trajectories of brain aging in women and men different in adults at risk for Alzheimer's disease compared to those not at risk for Alzheimer's disease? So this study was uh, led by my postdoctoral uh, trainee, Shada Ravapur. Okay, so this, the background for this data is it's from the STOP AD Center. Um, with the inaugural director was John Breitner and the current director is Arjun Parage and the associate director is Sylvia Villeneuve. And it's the analysis of the PREVENT AD cohort from, um, that was collected by the center. So if you want to know more about um, the center, I, I, I encourage you to visit this link. Um, so here we present uh, just the baseline data. So this is a cohort of adults that were collected in 2011 and have been followed up. And we not only collected uh, neuropsych, CSF data, behavioral data, but we also collected a large group of both um, MRI data and PET data. So here I'm only presenting to you the baseline task fMRI data that we have, but there is longitudinal task fMRI data available as well, and it's actually open access, so you could go and look at it yourself. Um, so just a bit about the cohort. So everyone in this cohort has a family history of Alzheimer's disease. So either their parent was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, or they had more than two first degree siblings that were diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Um, they were all 60 years of age or older, or like I said, there were some younger ones like 55 because they were within 15 years of their parents' AD onset. They had no other diagnosable cognitive disorder and they were generally in good health and were able to commit to perform to um, contribute to this longitudinal study. So in the original um, task fMRI at baseline, there's actually data for 327 adults. So it's a really rich data set. Um, we have very stringent um, inclusion exclusion criteria. So when we applied our inclusion exclusion criteria and also only in included individuals that had enough successful encoding and retrieval events in this paradigm. Um, our sample size for the original baseline analysis, which has been published already, um, also led by Shada, was much smaller. It was a sample size of 100 and, sorry, 197, I believe, or sorry, 172 older adults when we reduced um, based on performance on task and issues of uh, MRI data. Now, when we did the sex differences analysis, which is what I'm presenting to you today, our sample size was further reduced because again, because of the few male participants in this cohort. So we really need males to contribute to science more and participate in these research programs that are going on. So here's uh, the demographics and baseline assessment of the women and men that contributed to this um, study. So we had 41 women and 41 men See the age, the BMI, the years of education, and years of onset, um, so years before symptom onset in their parents. Um, these individuals were matched for age and education and BMI. So you can see there's no significant difference. Um, and then when you do that, you also see that there's very little um, sex differences in any of the neuropsychological assessments, though the women scored slightly higher in the MOCA. 
So we also show um, that there was very comparable memory performance on the task that we administered in the scanner. So here is the detail of the task that was administered. So it's similar to what we did in the adult lifespan study, but it was a bit, um, it was actually simplified because of the cohort that we were, we were testing. So we used object stimuli and we presented adults with 48 encoding stimuli present to the left or the right of the computer screen. So exactly the same as the adult lifespan study. And they were basically just asked to respond left if the object was on the left or respond right if the object was on the right um, at encoding. And they were told that their memory for these objects would be tested at a later time. So they knew that there was going to be um, a retrieval task. The retrieval task in this study occurred 20 minutes later. So the time between encoding and retrieval do differ between the two studies. So at retrieval, they saw only one object, whereas in the lifespan study, they saw two faces. So they saw one object in the center of the screen and they had to judge whether or not the object was familiar. Do you remember seeing the object? Or whether the object was originally presented to the left or originally presented to the right or whether the object was new. So remember the task demand here was to encode the object and its spatial location. So when subjects were presented with the object of retrieval, they, their, their task was to respond to the space it was located on. Only if they did not remember the spatial location would they select object as familiar. And they were encouraged not to guess in this task. So just to reiterate the memory performance in the women and men were comparable. In general, because of the task design, you have more source hits. So more um, likelihood of recollecting both the object and its location um, compared to just remembering um, the object and not remembering its location. So recognition. Now you could also think of recognition as being a source failure. And that's kind of the way that we start to think about um, this experimental design because the goal was to remember the source. So if you defaulted to say, I remember the, the object but not the source, it was actually more of a source failure that had as part of it an item recognition component. So we conducted exactly the same partial least squares analysis. So we try and keep the methods the same across all our analysis so the data and the results are comparable. Um, so we did both what we call an activation analysis using partial least squares, where we looked at sex differences in activation during successful encoding versus successful retrieval. And we also looked at brain behavior correlations in the same way that we did in the adult lifespan. But of course, we don't have age in this analysis because all the adults are older. So we don't have a lifespan in this um, analysis. So what I'm gonna to present to you are the general results we found the task activation analysis and also the behavior PLS analysis. So please don't be overwhelmed. I know it's a lot. Um, so here we have on the left-hand side, the task fMRI analysis, so the task activation analysis using PLS. On top, you see group similarities and on the bottom, you see uh, group differences. So here you have the traditional singular image. You have both positive and negative saliences. And here you have the, um, the profile for the different tasks at hand. So you have encoding activation for source hits, so objects that they not only recollected the objects correctly, but also the location, source failures, where they remembered the object but could not remember its location, and then retrieval hits, retrieval failures, and correct rejection, saying a new object is indeed a new object. So we see group similarities in both women and men at encoding. Um, so areas in blue were more activated in both women and men for items that were subsequently correctly retrieved at encoding. So this is the activations in blue are areas of encoding success in both women and men. And the areas in orange are areas of um, successfully rejecting new items as new. So you could think of it as a novelty response in these adults. But the main message here is that there were group similarities. So women and men showed the same pattern of activations for successful encoding versus uh, correct rejections. However, we did see group differences in activation. Here we see that men show task-specific modulation of activation during encoding and retrieval. So areas in orange here, which is the midline areas, as well as the dorsal visual stream going into lateral prefrontal cortex, men engage these regions to a greater degree during source hits. So events in which they correctly encoded um, both the object and location and retrieved that information. Activation in these areas were less for events in which 
males only identified objects without their location. Identifying objects alone was also related to greater activation of bilateral ventrolateral PFC. So these are patterns of group differences in activation. So what I want you to note is that here are the group similarities where women are engaging similar areas for encoding. Here are the group differences where men are engaging different unique patterns of activation for source hits versus source failures. Women are showing some similarity for source hits, but overall there isn't a unique pattern of engagement during encoding and retrieval in women um, where there is in men. And then when you carry over here, uh, sorry, to look at the brain behavior correlation analyses, you again see this kind of more generalized pattern of activation in women at encoding and at retrieval. So here you see um, the behavior PLS analysis where we looked at how brain activity directly correlated with task performance in women and men. And we looked at correlations for events where they performed well and remembered both the object and the location and events where they just remembered the object. So women, um, during both successful source hits and source failures, they engaged areas in the red to a greater degree and decreased activation in these blue regions at encoding. Now at retrieval, they engaged these blue regions, the negative salience regions, which included the ventral visual, the midline, some ventral lateral prefrontal, and some of the dorsal visual stream as well, to a greater degree during retrieval, and it supported their retrieval performance. Now in men, you see that there again was a task specific engagement of these brain regions. So for source hits, we saw greater activation of these um, positive salience regions and lower activation of the negative salience regions. And for source retrieval failure, men behave similarly to women. So what can we conclude from these prevent AD uh, results? So in the second exploratory analysis of sex differences in brain aging, we again observe the presence of sexual convergence and divergence, so sexual convergence and divergence in women compared to men in memory-related brain function. Notably, in both task-related activation and in the brain behavior correlation analyses, we observe that in family history positive older adult women, they exhibited a more generalized pattern of brain activation whereas men tended to show more task-specific activations. So from, this, from these results, we tentatively propose that women with a family history of Alzheimer's disease may exhibit de-differentiation of function. And since these are women with a family history, this may be an early marker of preclinical AD that is sex-specific. Now, going back and trying to bring everything together, so here you have um, the effect that we kind of highlighted in the women in the lifespan sample. So this is the effect where women engaged bilateral uh, frontal parietal activation and midline regions to a greater degree um, with increased age at encoding. And this was related to better subsequent memory for the hard task. Now, when you compare the results from both the exploratory analyses of sex differences from this adult lifespan and prevent AD cohort, we see that both samples in women engage similar regions, not at encoding, but at retrieval. So here you see that increased activation in these blue areas in the lifespan sample was indeed related to greater retrieval accuracy in women. However, activation was reduced with advanced stage in women. Now in the prevent AD sample, if you look at the, the negative salences here, you see that they're a dampened version to a large extent of what you see here, especially in the frontal and parietal areas um, compared to our lifespan sample. So, and in this cohort in women, again, engaging these areas supported retrieval accuracy. So in both these cohorts, the minus FH women and the plus FH women, engagement of these blue negative salience regions supported retrieval accuracy. However, these two groups significantly differed at encoding. So as engagement of these regions supported encoding for the hard task in our lifespan sample, engagement of these regions was negatively correlated with performance in the plus FH cohort in women. In men, it was not associated to any performance effects. So this indicates to us that there are indeed differential effects of the family history risk factor in women 
in older age. Now, what would be interesting and what we are currently planning to do is to look at the age effect in this cohort, because there is still a, a bit of a range, see if there are age-related decreases in these negative salience regions in the plus FH um, history group as well. So the general conclusions from exploring sex differences in both the adult lifespan and in the prevent AD cohort is that even if you don't see behavioral differences in women and men, the underlying brain mechanism supporting behavior may differ. So it really is important to disaggregate your brain activation data by sex. We also show in our lifespan data that midlife really is the critical period in adulthood where these differences start to emerge in brain aging. And we have yet to explore whether or not the sex differences emerge at midlife because of our small sample in the adult lifespan study. Now we know that there's a higher prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in women in advanced age. And taken together, all these things to, um, combined tell us that we really need to study women's brain health at midlife and examine the effect of Alzheimer's disease risk factors and other biological and environmental factors to understand how they may influence brain aging at this critical time, which is midlife. So that is basically what we're doing now. Um, we're doing what we call the Women's Brain Health, Aging and Menopause Study, um, where we're examining how individual differences in sex hormones and apoe genotype influence memory-related brain function in women primarily, and also if we could attract men, to get men into the scanner as well. We are focusing on middle age as the critical period of adult development and are focused on understanding how menopausal transition influences memory and brain structure and function at this time. Um, we are currently enrolling. Enrollment is through an online portal and followed in, following enrolling, there are two visits where we have uh, neuropsychological testing and blood draws on the first visit and then brain imaging on the second visit. So I'm gonna close this talk by saying, we really need your involvement and we need participants for this ongoing study, particularly middle-aged women and men. So if you have a pen or if you're on your computer, please type down this address and register to participate in our study. So I wanna close by again, thanking um, my trainees and my funding agencies and my collaborators for these projects that we've been doing in our lab. So thank you for your time. I hope I didn't lose you, it's a bit late. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raja, for this wonderful presentation, despite the challenges. We will now uh, start receiving the questions. So if you, if anyone has any questions, please um, raise your hands. Uh, we already have some questions in the chat. Okay, uh, some two questions from, from, uh, from Professor Gilbert Blaise de university, uh, from University of Montreal, Department of Anesthesiology. Uh, does hormonal therapy after menopause and andropause maintain the cognitive function? And the second one is whether androgens are effective in cognition in postmenopause women. Okay, um, so this is an ongoing question, right? This is um, one of the main areas of many people's research. So there is quite a debate about whether or not hormone and hormonal therapy um, will improve cognitive function in aging. So there have been studies that have shown that indeed hormonal therapy may be detrimental to cognitive function in aging if it's given later in life. So in postmenopausal, especially late postmenopausal women, there is some indication that hormonal therapy, um, both estrogen and progesterone, and early menopause or even in premenopause or perimenopause may be beneficial. But that's like, I don't want to say go take hormone therapy because you know, the jury is still out and there's many risk factors, especially if you have uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer in your family, these uh, hormone related cancers. Um, but at the moment, there isn't any consensus. So I think part of the goal of the ongoing study in my lab is to try and get a hint as to whether or not we are taking uh, information about whether women are, are, are on HRTs or have historically been on HRTs um, and also history of oral contraceptive use. So we are trying to get at that. Now, as far as androgen therapy, I am not sure. I'm not gonna comment on that because I don't do research in that area and I don't plan to do research in that area. But if we find something in our sample, I'll definitely report it. Um, I know there's been some work on um, androgen therapy in men, but I'm not sure about androgen um, therapy in women in postmenopause. Thank you very much. Um, any, any other questions? I also had a question uh, 
um, in the same direction. So I, I was wondering whether um, you looked at any potential interactions between the influence of sexual hormones, so uh, blood sexual hormones and the cognitive performance in the groups that were included in the novels. So in the adult lifespan, unfortunately, we did not do hormonal assays. So we don't have the hormone data for them to look at that. Um, we do have a post -met, like menopause self-rating in that, in that lifespan study. And I, what I did forget to mention this, and I want to note this, in case Savanya is there and she'll like, be annoyed that I didn't say this. <laughs> but in, um, in our sex differences analysis of the adult lifespan, we intentionally took out women that were early menop uh, post-menopause. So women that had just transitioned or were in the period of transition into menopause, we excluded that. So that also affected our sample a bit, that analysis, because we didn't want to get into the question of how is hormonal fluctuations at this stage affecting the interaction of sex and age. We were trying to do a more, I guess, pure analysis in some ways. Um, but also we do know that, um, you know, perimenopause and po early postmenopause, there are some cognitive effects in some women, not all women, and so we didn't want to kind of um, muddy the water by including that group. And also we didn't have enough of the sample size in that initial study to look at it separately. Mm -hmm. Now in the preventive D cohort, um, they're all older. So they're all postmenopausal women, right? Um, now they, they are now, I've asked, you know, I think in the future, they plan to collect some details about their reproductive health, such as parity and whether or not they took HRTs or contraceptives and things like that. But at the moment, there isn't like there. There was no need or any rationale to do the HRT um, hormonal measures because they were all postmenopausal and they were all older. So that was kind of the thinking. But it would be interesting, like with mass spec, to see if there are still variants in hormones in this cohort. But in the current study that I am recruiting for, so please participate. Um, we are doing all of that. So we're you know we learned from our lesson our lessons from our past study, and we're trying to do more representative and all-encompassing uh, study where we look at hormones, we look at multiple genes, not just APOE, and we're collecting many types of MRI data, uh, data not only task fMRI, but resting state and ultra high and high resolution um, structural MRIs as well. Uh, this is wonderful. So uh, um, based on the the pre-last study, if I uh, if I understand correctly, the classification was performed between men and women based on the biological sex parameters and yes. uh, based on self-identification as women, woman or men. Yeah. So was it possible from this perspective, was it possible to assess the potential um, difference in participants with uh, with respect to different bi difference in the biological um, and the self-identification self classifications? Um, so, do you mean like um, basically non-binary or are you... De depending on the test that you used, but pro most probably you had at least four groups in the, from this perspective. Yeah, so in, so in the Prevent AD and in the original lifespan, it really was, um, you know, it was very back in the day before we really started thinking about this in greater detail, at least in my lab, and we, ba we asked individuals what sex they identified with. And that was the only question. So, we, and it was male or female. We did not have an, other options in that study, and nor did the Prevent AD. Um, they had sex, uh, male or female. Now, in the current study that we're doing, we have um, both biological sex assigned at birth as a first wave question, and then gender identity as a second wave question. Now, there is work by Louise Pilot, which is very interesting, that looks at you know gendered um, behaviors and gendered biology to try and, try and tease apart sex assigned at birth versus more gendered biologies. Um, we haven't done that yet, but it would definitely be a questionnaire that would be interesting to incorporate. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we have one question from uh, Aman, Aman Badwar. She is a professor uh, here at CIGEM. Hi, <laughs> <Hi, Aman. laughs> um, I, I joined the talk a little bit late. I was chairing another meeting. Um, but so it might have been covered, but Natasha, um, so you, you ask for self-identification of gender. You also look at hospital charts. Um, now we know that the sex hormone can easily affect a lot of other systems like the insulin, et cetera. So in your current cohort that you're gathering, are you, I know you're looking at sex hormones, but have you, uh, 
put forth like cutoffs as to like, this is the good category for estrogen. That's the bad category for progesterone. Like, are we, are you thinking of maybe um, taking that into account for analysis as well? No, so we haven't done that yet. So this is the, one of the things that's tricky <laughs> is that women are like, you know, we're, we're cycling and so do men, men cycle too, right? So their testosterone levels change over time as well. Um, so we're not, we don't restrict women to come in only at the follicular phase, only at the luteal phase or anything like that. So we don't have, you know, these women have very different baselines, mm -hmm. right? Of estrogen and progesterone. And that's what you're getting at, that there might be some women that just are skewed. Um, so we really are just getting that data to categorize them using the straw categories as pre, you know, peri, post. Now, if we get more and more samples, we will look at it as a continuous variable, but we'll have to figure out how do we account for the variance in cycling and also cycle interacting with age and all these variables. So one, one way might be to look at proportions of estrogen to progesterone or estrogen to FSH or something like that but we don't have upper or lower limits. You know, we haven't seen anyone that's like really, like we're gonna, we're obviously gonna plot all of our data and see if there's anyone that are outliers, but we're not, we don't have any cutoffs for estradiol levels or testosterone and progesterone levels. So for, for the hormone test, is it uh, just a one, one blood sample test or do they come in at multiple times over the month? This Cycle. This is the issue with the straw category. So for the straw category, you really do need someone to come in multiple times to get a sense of variance. And that's why we can't categorize by straw stages in this study, but we're using the, the, the outline of straw, straw to just categorize by reproductive transition post, because that's really as good as we could do because we only have a one time, I shouldn't say that, we have a two time blood sample. They come, they come in at session one to give blood, session two, they give blood. So we do have a two time points, but I don't think that's sufficient to human variance, right? So we don't do multiple blood sampling to get at that. Okay, thank you, Natasha. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, do we have any other questions? Um, well, we, I guess we, this concludes, we are, we are past the initial uh, time that was uh, required for this presentation, sorry for that. Uh, thank, thank you, very, thank you once again, uh, Dr. Azar, for this marvelous presentation and for enlightening us about the influence of um, um, gender sex on the cognitive performance. Hopefully, we will be able to include these parameters in our future studies. Well, I hope so. Everyone should disaggregate their data by sex so, <laughs> and, gen and gender, if you can, with your data. Yeah, it's more challenging to define the, the scales that, that must be used, but this is the future analysis. Well, right. thank you very much, and we are. It's, uh, waiting for your next, for your next results and next presentations. Awesome! Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.